Ephesians chapter 6. Lord willing, this should be the last of the book of Ephesians. As far as teaching, a bunch of preaching can be happening here. <laughs> Amen. Uh, really good stuff in this book. It's been a blessing. Uh, just to bring you up to speed again, uh, we've covered through verse 17. Uh, we look first of all at the child's requirement. If you remember, we talked about the command for them to obey their parents for this is right. The compensation, give them a length of days. And then we talk about the care, how the father was not to provoke the children to wrath. And then we talked about the compliance required. That's where we talked about the servant and his service. And then we uh, come to the conflict revealed. And that's where we're at now. Verse 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord in the, and in the power of his might. Now, it reminded me of what the Lord said to Joshua. Uh, turn back here and look at Joshua chapter 1. In Joshua chapter 1 verse 9. Joshua 1 9. He says, Have not I commanded thee, this was the Lord speaking to Joshua. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. It's going to take some courage to stand up for what's right. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. What a blessing that is to know that the Lord gave that assurance to Joshua in the Old Testament and we have that same assurance in the New Testament. He said he'd never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. So under number three, the conflict revealed, is this is about the Christian's warfare, the Christian's battle, the conflict that we're in. When, when you get saved, you entered into the Lord's army. And Paul likens that warfare to a war, a battle. And he lets us know that that battle is not with flesh and blood. It's not with each other, but it's with spiritual things. It's a spiritual battle. And he says to put on the whole armor of God in verse 11. And then he describes a first century Roman soldier suit of armor. And he goes through it and gives us some details that will help us. And we're going to look at that. But for those of you that were taking notes, you can look at the energy to be strong in the Lord. Uh, we can look at the enemy. We're going to be fighting against principalities and power, powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. We can look at the equipment, and you can list all the equipment. You can look at the encouragement. You can look at the exaltation. You can look at all the things you want to. It's amazing what all you can find in this little section. I've actually preached a series of about six or seven messages out of that this little passage here. I'm not going to reiterate any of it, but uh, I will uh, just kind of go through and give you the highlights. In verse 10, he says, Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We're not to put confidence in the flesh, according to Philippians 3.3. 3. That's right. The only thing I put confidence in this flesh is knowing that it'll do wrong every chance I give it. That's the only thing I can hate, take and say I am confident in one thing. I'll do wrong every time I mess it up if I ain't careful. That's right, brother. You say, preacher, that's horrible. That, what about self-esteem and we're supposed to build each other up. That's yeah, look what look what it's done for us. Look around at our kids today and see what it's done for us. Yeah. That's right. That teaching uh, helped us a bit, has it? 
We got a bunch of kids, a bunch of young people now that have an attitude of expectancy. They expect everything to be given to them. They expect everything to go their way all the time. They expect no trouble. They expect to start out where we took years to get. Amen. Amen. But anyway, our strength is to be in the Lord. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. We're to put confidence in Him and what He said. Okay? When you enter into the service for the Lord, you do well to know that your education and your talent is of no use if God's not in it. Amen. You can be the most gifted speaker. You can have the greatest personality. You can be a, a talented singer, musician. You can have all the... The, the worldly talents and all the worldly blessings, so to speak, to go with it. But if God's not in it, it's no good. Right. You'll go far in Hollywood, in Nashville. You'll go far in the world's eyes. Yo, old Steve. But spiritually, he ain't making a dent in the battle. Right. You tell me one battle he's actually won. If anybody, if anybody gets saved, and they probably do, if anybody gets saved under his ministry, what kind of Christian are they going to turn out to be? About as worldly as you can make one. Yes. Mm. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Again, the armor he's getting ready to describe is a first century Roman foot soldier. The Christian's life is likened to a warfare. And Paul is telling the soldier of Christ what his equipment is. This is like orientation. He's going to go through and tell you what each piece is and what it kind of represents. And it's a shock to a lot of people to realize that the Christian life is meant to be a battle. You're at war with the flesh, the world, and Satan. And if you're not properly equipped, properly informed, properly trained, you'll fall. The enemy will prevail. He will get you. But, Today, you don't hear a whole lot about the warfare. Today, you don't hear a whole lot about Christian fighting. Today, you don't hear, you know, love and ecumenical movement. Can't we all just get together and get along and sing kumbaya around the campfires? You, you, you know what I mean? It's a bunch of junk. It's fleshly entertainment. It's fun. No one's willing to fight. We got too many conscientious objectors. Take me all, just get along. A soldier's to fight. What would you think of a soldier that enlisted in the army and then when the battle was raging, refused to fight? We enlisted in the army. And today, many are refusing to fight. They won't fight their flesh. They won't fight the, the, the devil. They won't fight the world. They, they, just, they just lay down and let them run over them. Notice, notice verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God. What? That you might be able to stand. Not for Satan in the crowd and the world and the flesh. But against. You're going to stand against something. And if you try to live for God, I'm going to tell you, you're going to go against this world. If you're going to try to live for God, you're going to have to go against this flesh. And you will be against Satan. Amen. So, uh, but he don't tell us that just once. Verse 11, we're to stand. Then look at verse 13. Wherefore, we're taking your whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Then in verse 14, stand therefore. You see that? Stand, stand, stand. It's so hard to get anyone to stand for the truth today. 
They'll stand up for homosexual rights. They'll stand up for uh, 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 abortion. They'll stand up for the sodomites and the, uh, the weirdos in, of today. They'll stand up and fight for those causes. They'll march in the streets. Yep. But where's those that standing for truth and righteousness? Hey, yes, sir. Where's those that's going to stand up for what matters? Matters. We're going to march for what matters. <laughs> Amen. Oh my goodness. I'm going to get in trouble, ain't I? Mm. It's something interesting. As we go through this list, you're going to notice that there's nothing to cover your back. When you stand, you're to face the battle. If you turn your back or you try to run, you're exposed to the enemy. Here's another thing to think about. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of illustrate this one. Say we're in the we're in the Lord's army and there's a great battle that's taking place right here. Like happens on some Sunday morning services sometimes. Somebody comes in and they're lost and there's a battle for their soul going on. We're the Lord's army. The invitation comes and uh some start rattling their keys. Some start getting their belongings ready. Some start doing things to distract yep. the, the sinner from, from hearing the invitation. You, you give him a, an excuse to look to you rather than look to himself or at the altar or the preacher, the one trying to get him to come. You, you, you're, you're distracting. Now, now watch. And he, here's another thing to think about. Say this is a battle. There's a battle going on right here. And we're in this army together. We're all lined up. And we're going to fight the enemy. There's a danger that most people don't even think about. We all have our armor on. We're all here. We're ready. We're prayed up. We're ready to fight. We're facing the enemy together. We're together. We're together. There's a danger in running too far out in front of your own people. You get so far out and you're fighting the enemy and they're shooting you in the back. It's called friendly fire. Many have been shot down by friendly fire. Many have killed their own because they were way out in front of them. Sometimes, sometimes you get a preacher or a Christian it may be you and your family. Maybe you was the first one to get saved and you started witnessing and started telling them about the Lord and the next thing you know, your own people shooting you in the back. Oh, he's got religion. Oh, he's one of them Bible thumpers. Oh, he's one of them. Oh, he, yeah, you, you just got to watch him. You, oh, yeah, yeah. Bang, they're just shooting you in the back. The ones that should have your back cover you, protect you. That's why police officers and soldiers say that. I've got your back. I've got your back. Said, I'm going to watch you six. They're going to take care of you. They're not going to shoot you in the back. They're going to they're gonna help protect you. Amen. But we've got too many shooting their own leaders and their own people in the back. Mm. Mm. We, should shut, we should save our shots for the enemy. Yes. Yeah. Sin, Satan, and this wicked society we're living in. Uh, we're to stand against the wiles of the devil. Wiles, that's his tricks, his tactics. And he will use many tricks and tactics to get you. He'll use drugs and alcohol. He'll use rock and roll, country, music. He'll use rap. He'll use anything that he can to deceive you and entrap you and enslave you. He wants to ruin you. Today, he uses social media, pornography. He uses news. He uses politics. He uses religion. Anything he can use, he'll use. At verse 12. For we wrestle not. We're putting on the armor for this cause. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. 
Our fight's not with each other. I say that over and over and over and over. We shouldn't be fighting amongst ourselves. Our fight's not with each other. It's usually with the one whispering in someone's ear. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, it's a spiritual battle. The prince of the power of the air is what Satan's called. He is the god of this world. Yes, amen. That's why a Christian is not supposed to love this world. It's under Satan's control right now. Yeah. He's calling the shots for now. For now. Do you think the Lord's in control with homosexuals run across the land like they are? Do you think the Lord's in control with abortions going on like they are? Do you think the Lord's in control with transgenders being elected to the highest offices in our land? The God of this world has control right now. Yes, sir. Yep. But one day the right king's going to come Amen. and he's going to take his throne. Amen. Verse 13. Wherefore, taking you the whole armor of God. I like that. Notice something here. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor. You ought to circle that. Then verse 13. Wherefore, taking you the whole armor. You know what you have a lot of times? You have a lot of people say, oh, I want the helmet of salvation. I want to be saved, but don't give me the shoes shod with the preparation of the gospel. I want to be saved, but I don't want to go witnessing. That's right. I want to be saved, but I'm not going to carry the gospel to another land. I want to be saved, but I'm not going to walk across the street and witness to my neighbor. I want to be saved. See, they, they pick and choose what they want. Oh, give me the shield of faith. Yeah, I like it. It's pretty. It's shiny. I can tell everybody I've got faith. I've got faith, but don't give me the sword of the Spirit. I don't want to have to tell you about what the Bible says. I don't want to cut them. I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to offend nobody. Are you with me? They're picking and choosing. We're told to put on the whole armor of yeah. God. It's going to take it all. Right. Wherefore, taking you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now, in verse 13, again, you have people that want parts. They don't want to take it all. They want to hold office, but they don't want to go soul winning. They want to teach, but they don't want to pass out tracts. I'd be like an usher saying, I want to be an usher, but I don't want to shake nobody's hand. I don't want to greet anybody. Are you with me? Yeah. It's like a preacher saying, I want to preach, but he don't want to preach. <clears throat> he just wants a title. I don't know. Now, the armor is not just offensive or defensive. It's both. It does both. It defends. Now, the, you, you're going to have the shield of faith that will quench the fiery darts of the devil, right? When he shoots at you, you got something to hold up. But you know what they used to do back in the early uh, first century? They would sharpen the edge of their shield. And that thing was just as sharp as their sword sometimes. Or they'd put a big spike coming out of that shield that they could thrust it into somebody. Or they could take it and just swing that shield, that shield and it would act like a razor coming across there and cut and slash. So not all of the weapons were defensive. Some of them were offensive. The sword could defend a blow but it was also designed to strike. When Jesus was tempted of the devil, he took the sword and said, it is written and cut him. He sliced him up three times before he left wounded. Amen. That's a good way to look at that. Let's keep going. Look at verse 14. Verse 14. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the strength of a man is in his loins. That's your midsection. 
uh, your back, your abdomen. That's where you draw your strength. Uh, you want to you want to you want to know that's true. Let something go wrong with your back and realize you can't do nothing when your back's gone. Have surgery where they cut your belly. You'll find out real quick you can't move without that uh, without that stomach. I mean, I'm telling you, your strength comes from the core. Amen. And what is our stand there for having your loins? First thing we're to do is have our loins girt about with truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. The greatest thing that they had was the truth. Amen. Our strength is the truth in the word of God. When the devil shoots fiery darts at our kids, evolution, evolution, they ought to be able to hold up the shield of faith and quench that dart. I don't believe that. I believe that Jesus created us. Amen. I believe the yeah. Lord did it. God created the heavens and the earth. That shield of faith. And without that truth being girt about with truth, they're going to have the strength to lift that shield. Amen. Gives you something to think about, don't it? Now, let's just keep going. And it says, having the breastplate of righteousness. This is our personal righteousness. Now, when we get saved, we get Christ's righteousness. That's how we get to go to heaven. Amen. Uh, he became sin for us who had no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen. I think that's 2 Corinthians 5, 11, something like that. Somebody look that up and see if that's right. 21, 5, 21. That's right. Yes. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Uh, let's just keep going. Uh, talked about that breast plate of righteousness. Now, I wasn't going to do this, but I looked through and I that breastplate is to protect the heart. That's one of the most vital organs. You, you want to sure kill them? Two shots that will take out your enemy. A head blow and a stab them through the heart. Either one of them take them out. That's, that's instant death. They're done. You know what the devil's after? He's after our kids' minds, attack of the head, and he's after their hearts. He's after their hearts. And he'll yeah, use every weapon that he can. And uh, there's many battles being fought. The Christians aren't even showing up for the battle. When it comes to school curriculums and school programs, the world seems to get their way, not the Christian. Music, what kind of music are they listening to? What kind of... What kind of TV are they watching? What kind of movies are they watching? Now stop and think about that. In a Christian nation, a nation that claims to be Christian, founded on the Word of God, the, the public school system is now a government school system, but it used to be to teach our young people, our children, the Word of God. Yes, sir. The Bible was actually one of the required school books. Yes. They got the Bible out in school. They read from the Bible. A lot of their illustrations and stuff came from the Bible. Now it's been banned and they brought in humanism, evolution, uh, same-sex marriage, sex education. Yeah. They brought in all kinds of perversions. That's right. Where were the Christians? Where was the voices of opposition? Where was the resistance? Where were the marchers and protesters? Where were those that were supposed to stand? Well, I guess it's something to think about. He's winning the minds of professing Christians' children through the school system. Through the TV, through the radio, through the internet. He, he's using his tools very well. I don't care what the devil says, and I don't care what the world says. I don't care what the homosexuals say. I'm not worried about being politically correct. I'm not worried about offending anyone. If it offends them, good. 
Doesn't bother me a bit. I don't care. Uh, I don't care. God made them a male and female. Amen. 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 I don't care if they take hormones, grow 36 double D breasts, and cut their genitalia off. It's still a man. He's just a messed up man. And no man in his right mind would want that. Amen. 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 All right, let's keep going before I get in more trouble. Verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now there's one people like. They like the last part. They don't want to take the gospel. They just want to take the peace part. That's that picking and choosing. You know, and your feet shod. You should have your shoes on. Be prepared to go. Be prepared to preparation of the gospel. Be prepared to preach, to witness, to soul win. Be prepared to give an answer to every man according to the hope that lieth in you. Okay? Wherever you go, that means at work, when, the, when they start talking nonsense, you ought to be able to straighten them out. Amen. When they're going through something hard, you ought to be able to give them a verse or something to help encourage them, help strengthen them. When they're laughing and making a fool of themselves, bragging about their sin and their folly, you should be able to take them aside and help them. You say, well, they'll hate me. They hated me for years. But it's a funny thing. When their marriages was messed up, they didn't go to their buddies that they told dirty jokes to. They didn't go to the, the buddies that, that, that they went out and partied with. They came to the guy they hated for advice. When their marriage was on the rocks. When their kids wasn't doing right. When their kid was off uh, in drugs or off messing with something they ought not do. Where did they go? They went to the guy they hated. Yeah, 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 that's it. See, they they don't hate you. They hate what you represent. They know you're right. They're just not going to admit it. Now, if you're one of those Christians that jump in and tell dirty jokes, if you're one of those Christians that laugh at their filthy jokes, and you're one of those Christians that participates in their sin, they have no respect for you at all. Don't look for them to come to you. They might like that and say, yeah, he's a good old boy. I like him. But in their mind and in their heart, they're thinking he's just a wicked, low-down, two-faced hypocrite. Amen. I'd rather them cuss me to my face. At least I know where it stood. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Sounds awful. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Some of you, some of you's living it. Some of you go through it. You, you, you'll see what I'm talking about. You'll understand. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, verse 16, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. When he shoots at our kids' heads and minds and tries to fill it with trash, if you've had them in Sunday school, you've had them in church. They've heard the gospel preached. They've accepted Christ as their Savior. They've got faith in the Lord. That faith can carry them through. When they try to teach about evolution, I don't believe that. I don't believe it. See, that, that shield of faith. You've put a shield of faith around them. They, they've, they've got something else to protect them. But if they're not brought up in Sunday school and when they teach them where they were born that way, that God made a mistake, that that really is supposed to be a girl, they're going to believe it because they're not getting the truth anywhere. They're just getting the world view, the devil's view. Yeah. That's why Sunday school is important. That's why Wednesday night's important. That's why church is important because here's where you're going to sharpen your sword, hey. sharpen your shield. Amen. Most of you probably never thought of the shield as an offensive weapon. But you can take your faith and cut somebody to pieces with it. Amen. If you put a couple spikes on that thing and you run into somebody and put, mashed him up against the wall or tripped him and fell on him with that thing, you can just pierce him right through. 
If you had that edge sharpened, you could pick it up and just come down on them, just about cut them in half. When he throws us, when he throws his sword at you and swings his sword at you, you can block it here and then move it just to strike. Amen. Good stuff. Yeah, picture this stuff, man. I had a good fight going on in my head today. I mean, it's all over the battlefield. They're rolling around, almost ninja-like. <laughs> them Roman soldiers were mad. <laughs> Amen. I see. Let's keep going. We've talked about his fiery darts, uh, and he is shooting at them. He's shooting at you. He's shooting at your wife. He's shooting at your preacher. He's shooting at your Sunday school teacher. He's shooting at these young preachers. He's shooting at Christians that you sit across from every day. He, 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 he has an army, and they're well armed. They're well armed. All you have to do is look around today. They're well armed, and they've got many, many, many different ways that they can attack. And they're going for the head shot, mess with your thinking, or going for the heart. Get you to fall in love with this world. Get you to fall in love with this flesh. Get you to fall in love with some sin. Get you thinking, well, maybe they were born that way. Maybe I am a little too intolerant. Maybe I should apologize for being the way God made me. You see what I mean? Maybe I am the problem. Somebody been shooting you in the head. You've had a couple of head blows, ain't you? It knocked you pretty good. Amen. <laughs> Something ain't right in the noodles. Something rolling around. Amen. Verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation. I was talking about that a second ago. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, the sword, of course, is a double-edged sword according to Hebrews. It cuts both ways. And if you don't know how to handle that sword... You can cut yourself with it. Because it's sharp on both ends. And there's a lot of people who don't know how to handle the sword. We're to rightly divide the word of truth. Yes. There's proper divisions to it. And the reason I say that is I spent most of my day today studying in Psalms and reading what other commentators and uh, other preachers have said about the Psalms. And I'm telling you, I, I was I was watching, I was I was uh, reading and, and in my mind picturing them in the battle and watching them bleed to death from self-inflicted wounds. They don't know how to handle their sword. They would go to they would go to hack somebody and cut their own back, or they'd miss and come down and cut their foot off. <laughs> Amen. They don't know what they're doing. That's right, brother. That's a fact. They messed with their sword. Uh, that's the ones. That's the ones that had the sword. Most of them was going to battle without a sword. Well, in the original, or a better translation would be, or this is a this is an unfortunate translation here in the King James because the originals say what they've done is they're they're, they're dulling they're dulling your sword before you they give it to you to go to battle. You, you didn't get a actual sword. Rather than a sword, they give you one of them wooden sticks that they learn with. <laughs> You're getting a... That, that's the NIV, the ASV. Yes, you sir. with me? The modern translations. Yes, sir. Either that or it'd be like going into battle with somebody like that. It'd be like facing somebody with a three-foot double-edged sword and you pull out a case of double-edged with a three-inch blade. He don't have to be very good. He's going to slice you to pieces. Because he's got the sword. You've got a pocket knife. Think about that. You're not going to... What, what's that pocket knife going to do? You ain't going to get close enough to hurt him. Oh my. You ain't going to get close enough to hurt sin. You're not going to get close enough to cause them to think. You're not going to get close enough to stir their hearts with those little... Pocket knives and daggers. You with me? Oh my. Verse, where we at? 
Oh, you know where we are. 18. 18. Let me say something about 17. That helmet of salvation. You know, you ought to block what comes into your head. Knowing the devil's after your mind. You, you, you ought to block what goes into your kid's head. Especially when they're younger. I mean, it gets to a point when they get older, uh, you, 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 they're going to go out on their own. They're going to be listening to what they want to listen to, doing what they want to do, that kind of thing. They're going to be in school and all this stuff, and, and they'll be forming some of their own minds and thoughts, and you'll be sitting there looking at them like thinking, I didn't raise a kid that stupid, did I? It happens. It happens. You can raise them right. But it, boy, I tell you what, if they're not careful with what, if they're not told, if they're not informed, if they're not instructed to be careful about what goes in, yeah. it will take effect. That's right. You can't let trash flush through your system on a daily basis and not walk away and without walking away dirty yourself. Are you with me? But you keep flushing that system out with the Word of God, and it'll help clean that stuff up. All right? Remember the minnow bucket illustration. All right. Uh, let me ask you a question. Has anybody put up a no dumping sign? I need a hat that says no dumping here. Amen? I don't want your dirty jokes. I don't, I don't want your... You, you, you know what I mean? No dumping here. Just just wear that hat. You know, no dumping here. <laughs> you ever hear anybody say, what's on your mind? Sometimes I wonder that about people. What's on their mind? Sometimes you can tell what's on their mind. Mm. The bigger question is, who put it there? Was it the Lord? Or was it the devil? Where'd that thinking come from? Amen. The sword of the Spirit against the Word of God, Hebrews 4, 12. And I'd hate to enter into a battle, and it's useless to enter into a battle without the sword of the Spirit. That is the Christian strength. That is our main offensive weapon. Jesus showed us, gave us an example when he was tempted of Satan directly. Satan himself came and tempted the Lord. Satan had conquered every foe he'd ever faced till Jesus. And how did Jesus walk away? It is written. It is written. It is written. Only chance you have is to put on the whole armor that you might stand against the wiles of the devil. Put on that whole armor and use that sword when tempted. Amen. So when they ask you if you want to go out, party with them. Think, find, your, find your Bible verse out of Proverbs about hanging out with fools. They tempt you to look at some filth or something like that. Look, look, what Job, look up what Job said. I'll set no wicked thing before my eyes. It's either Job or David. Job said, why then should I look upon the maid? That's what he said. That's right. That's what he said. So look up those verses. Yeah, if they're tempting you with drinking or drugging uh, or something like that, whatever your temptation may be, uh, wine is a mocker, strong drinks rage, and whoever's whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Right. Look up those verses and have them ready. Amen. Verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now, he's, he's listed the armor. And again, I've got those messages. I deal with each one of them, each one of those pieces, the whole message. But when he gets to the end of that armor, he says, praying always with all prayers and supplications in the Spirit. And that got me to thinking, there's one piece that was not mentioned in that armor. The leg greaves, the piece that covers your knees, your shins, that protects, protected them. Do you know why that's missing? Because your fight is to take place while you're on your knees. 
if you're on your knees, they're covered, yes, they're sir. protected. Amen. You're stronger on your knees in your Christian life. On your knees. Yes. Uh, gives you that. That's something to think about right there. And here's something else. Now, it's easy to pray for your loved ones. It's easy to pray for your children. I hope you are. Are you praying for your children and your grandchildren? It's easy to pray for them. They're the ones you love. But how about the end of the verse for all the saints? You ought to be praying for the preacher, the youth pastor. You ought to be praying for the young preacher. You ought to be praying for the Sunday school teacher. You ought to be praying for the family that just come in, the family that's going through something. You ought to be praying for each other, all the saints. Amen. So the conflict is revealed. Number four in the outline is the courage requested. Look at this. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for the which I am an ambassador. He's a representative in bonds. He's in prison under house arrest. That therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now, 19 and 20 you see Paul praying for boldness, and you see, and you see him talking about the bonds there. Uh, but here's what struck me in that one. Here, Paul, the greatest Christian that ever lived, who stood before King Agrippa, who said, "Almost thou persuadest me," who who demanded, as a Roman, to be treated correct, he demanded to go to these different places in judgment. He demanded to be heard. He spoke with boldness. He's one of the boldest preachers that you'll ever read after is Paul. I mean, they stoned him, left him for dead because of his preaching, and he gets up and goes back in town to do it again. And he's praying for boldness. Don't you think we ought to be praying for more boldness? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Lord, help me. Amen. If the, one of the boldest preachers I've ever read, Paul, is praying for, asking for prayer that he might have boldness, that he might speak more boldly, I think we need to be praying the same. Lord, help me to speak more boldly at home. Speak more boldly at work. Speak more boldly with the family. Speak more boldly with my neighbors. Amen. I'll tell you something. This world's bold, ain't they? We're supposed to be fearless. We're supposed to take courage. Yes. But it yes. seems like the queers and the effeminate have more backbone than some Christians. Somebody that prefers... Long nails and lace has more backbone than some men. That's pitiful. That's pitiful. That's a shame to all us men. Amen? Amen. Don't think I'm fussing at you. I'm fussing at us. If Paul prayed it, I guarantee you I need it too. You say, preacher, you speak pretty bold. No, you don't know how much I refrain myself. <laughs> <laughs> you say, what? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's more in there. Lord, give me the boldness and just say it. Amen. But anyway, <laughs> let's keep going. The comfort received. That would be the last few verses here, 21 through 24. The comfort received. Now, in 21, he says, But that ye may also know my affairs and how I do, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord shall make known to you all things. One of his faithful ministers, uh, one of his faithful preachers, I guess you would say, minister, is going to come and tell him at the church there at Ephesus how Paul's doing and what's going on with his ministry. Look at this, verse 22. Whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that ye might know our affairs, and that he might comfort your hearts. Then he closes, Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus 
in sincerity. Amen. Amen is what I can say to that. That's pretty well self-explanatory. Anybody have any questions on the book of Ephesians? All right. And again, yes, sir, brother. Notice what it says. How to love the Lord Jesus in sincerity. Now, if you truly love him, you talk about him. Now, what do I say then? Because I've been doing this since the Lord saved me. And that love is produced. And I you know you say that love is it's produced by the Holy Spirit. That's called like I've been loved. The Spirit love. And when you love someone, what do you do? You brag about it. You talk about it. I was doing that today. Amen. And uh, the streets of states. You love them, you, you go talk about them. But if you just come and you say, well, I love the Lord, brother Louis, I love the Lord, but you never talk about them, I think you're very anemic. You need to get the Holy Spirit love inside of you, but you just say, because if you do, Brother, you're going to talk about him. That's what Paul did. You talk about the greatest Christian. You're right. But that's what he did. And, 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 and especially in Acts chapter 20, where he says day and night, day and night, day and night. Nothing to do and talking to people. Shame on us. That's why the nation is in the shame, is it? Because the Christians are not in the battle. They're not in the fight. That's a problem. Give something to think about. He made me think about something. When you first got married, you loved your spouse. And you didn't mind telling anybody and everybody. In fact, you loved you so much, you had a big public affair and you invited everybody to come and see you proclaim your love for them. Got to put it on silent. Uh, proclaim your love for them. And you did that publicly. Yep. And, uh, man, you'd come back, honeymoon, bragging on your spouse, how much you loved them, how sweet they were, how good they were, how strong they were, how... I, 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 you couldn't tell. Uh, nobody could say anything bad about them. You'd be ready to fight them. But they mock the Lord. They mock his family. So if they said anything about your spouse or their family, you'd be ready to fight. But they mock the Lord and were a spouse to be married. You're supposed to love him just like you would your spouse. Amen. Amen. So, if you wouldn't stand up for the Lord, are you saying you wouldn't stand up for your spouse? That's interesting, ain't it? Oh. Just like you would defend their reputation, their honor, you ought to defend his. Because the world is doing everything they can right now to tear him down. And his family. Mm, that's interesting. All right, let's all stand. Unless somebody else got something. Anybody have anything you want to question or comment? How many of you like the book of Ephesians? Amen. Man, that's a good book, ain't it? I'll tell you, that's an amazing book. Uh, it'll be uh, available on a CD or two in just a little while and uh, uh, if you want to get it and give it to somebody do so amen uh, if I think most of all of this one's online as well so if they want to watch it I don't know why if you listen to it probably be easier than keep doing something I used to love to listen to especially driving I like putting in preaching or study CDs yeah I still got CDs you kids don't know what that is I started with cassettes. Y'all really lost now, ain't you? I still remember eight tracks. And vinyl. <laughs> I'm glad the eight tracks are gone. Don't care for the vinyl, man. Them big, big old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but, but uh, anyway, let's go ahead and we'll be dismissing a word of prayer. Go praying. Lord willing, Lord willing, we'll be in uh, Psalms again Sunday morning in Sunday school. If you've got a thought or a book or something like that that you would like to know more about, let me know and we'll jump on it on Wednesday nights 
or uh, may take a break in Psalms because it's going to take a few years to get through Psalms. You might get tired of it. I mean, it changes subjects uh, quite frequently, so to me it's very interesting and I enjoy it, but some people like to jump around more, so if you got a book or something you're interested in, let me know and I'll study it out and we'll, we'll teach on it. Amen? All right. Brother Ryan, if you would please dismiss us, brother. Lord, sure do thank you for letting us come to church tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your word and getting through the Ephesians. Thank you for the pastor that taught us these past few uh, months on it. Help us to not just to hear it, but to also take heed and do and practice what you told us to do. Uh, bless Sunday coming up. Keep us safe for the week. We love your friend. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And again. Good night, John.